-hmm. Thank you. Ladies, if you'd like to come on up. <coughs> Madam Chair, House Bill 727 is an Anne Arundel County bill, and it provides for a uh, moratorium on uh, wireless telecommunication towers through uh, June 30th of 2016. Uh, the purpose of the moratorium is to allow us, the General Assembly, and or our Board of Education to determine whether we want to, to establish a policy on leasing public school uh, property to a private entity. We also would like to review the potential, uh, a potential modification to the process that our school board currently has in place uh, with respect to uh, cell towers. For instance, right now, we don't have uh, a vote for a cell tower goes up at school by our school board. And other jurisdictions have different policies that I think mine lend, lend themselves better. For example, in Montgomery County, I believe uh, the school has some say in whether or not they want to go forward with this. And finally, we want to determine whether or not that the amount of money that we are receiving for the cell towers is appropriate. Are we maximizing the return on our investment that we're making? So, and I would add that uh, we are working on this bill. It has not been voted on yet. I believe it's scheduled for a vote tomorrow. You have some amendments in your packet that I'll be pro uh, providing tomorrow, and I've spoken to them. We have one or one on the way. And that amendment's going to talk about who would be on this task force within our uh, county delegation to look at um, uh, these issues. Uh, that, in a nutshell, is, is the bill. Uh, I would add also in your packet, because the question has arisen, and this is another reason for us to study it, uh, whether or not, as a matter of public policy, uh, our school board was under the impression that they had to do this, that you weren't able to say no to a cell tower. Um, our Attorney General has made clear that we can as a matter of public policy. I provided that to you for your perusal. And I also asked for a more recent Attorney General's opinion just with respect to this moratorium in case there is any question about that. Uh, and the Attorney General has also said that it is permissible. I think those are the pertinent facts, Madam Chair, and uh, I am more than happy to answer any questions. Would you like the panel to go before I take questions, if, if there are any? We'll, we'll take, the, take the questions. Yes, ma'am. Any questions or response? I don't want to take questions. Thank you. I know you said the county hasn't uh, – the delegation hasn't taken it up. The school board uh, has come out and opposed it. Uh, your reasons why they opposed it? Well, actually um, – they do, but the amendments that we're working on are designed to answer their concern. One of their major concerns was, and I don't purport to speak for the school board, but I, I will say that they mentioned one of their major concerns had been the amount of time that the bill, as drafted, was going to take school board staff uh, to answer some of the questions that were posed in the original bill. We've stricken uh, the requirement for them to report things to us. And instead, we're going to substitute this task force to look into it. Um, I was told by our county delegation uh, chairman that they are pleased with the amendments and that they think with the addition of a school board member to the delegation a task group that's looking into it, an additional amendment that is not before you, as I said, we have not acted on this bill yet in our delegation, that they would withdraw their opposition not to speak for them hearsay from my chairperson to me okay and um also you know we had this issue in prince george's county where the school board did it and then uh, now you know we've reviewed legislation that would say okay now they must uh kind of talk about uh, we we defined it as a uh, non-educational use for school property uh and this way you know in doing so and coming to an agreement with them that's it you know, when you put that moratorium on, you, you know, that, that's kind of big. When you're saying you won't do anything until 2023, what if uh, in 2018 or 2017 they determine that they want to work not, together? Not 2023, 2016. Uh, basically, it would allow us uh, a year through next year's session of the legislature to come up with what we think are appropriate policies and guidelines. So the, the bill, as it's drafted, would have a moratorium until June 30th, 
of 2016. Okay, sorry, I misread. No, no problem. Makes sense. Thank you. We'll go to the panel. It's Lynn Bieber. Do you want to start, James? We're go going ahead. to start with me, if that's okay. That's fine. Just say your name. Uh, Janice Zink Sartucci. I have eight fast facts for you about this bill. The first one, as has been brought up, the Maryland Attorney General has opined that public schools do not have the authority to enter into transactions involving long term leases of school property for commercial use. In that opinion, the Attorney General stated, in reaching the conclusion that the Board lacks authority to enter into the proposed lease, Board Council relied on the annotated code that says local boards hold school property in trust for the benefit of the school system. And that's really what's at the, at the heart of this discussion. Um, with regard to Anne Arundel County, there's no public record of the Anne Arundel Board of Education voting to award a contract for the construction of cell towers to public schools uh, uh, to milestone communications to build on public schools. Um, the Maryland Open Meetings Act calls for public bodies to be accountable to their actions by recording their votes and their minutes. We're entitled to that information. We don't have that in Anne Arundel County. There's no ed ed Anne Arundel County Board of Education minutes that reflect the award of this contract, and so we'd like to get that cleared up. Cell towers on public school land are required by Maryland law to pay property taxes. School boards don't pay property taxes. They're tax exempt. We know this. Maryland law is clear, and I've attached the regulations to my public comment. Cell towers on public land owe Maryland property taxes. However, by using the Board of Education's tax account identification number, cell companies are avoiding paying Maryland property taxes, in fact, hiding in plain sight. In Anne Arundel County, the Broadneck High School cell tower is up and does not have a tax ID, is not paying property taxes. That's a loss of revenue to the state and the county. Um, as the delegate mentioned, the uh, Board of Education is not required by federal law to lease public school land. Um, there is no such requirement, and we seem to have some, some confusion, confusion about that point in the Anne Arundel County Board of Education. The cell tower leases for Broadneck High School and the Center of Applied Technology North School in Anne Arundel County that have already uh, have the towers either in construction or up are not with the company that was approved by the Board of Education. They're with a separate company. So again, we have one company getting an award of contracts, allegedly, and now we see leases with an entirely different company. Again, the moratorium would help clear this up. I have in front of me the permit to build a tower at the Magathy um, River Middle School. On that permit application, it's been signed by someone named Lawrence Alberts. Don't know who he is, probably a nice guy. Have him over to dinner, it'd be great, but he's not the board president. He's not uh, the superintendent. We have no information that shows he's been delegated the authority to build on public school land. And public school land is community. It's a community asset. People live next to it. They have a right to know what's going on there. We have a right to a public po process for how these commercial entities <coughs> are going up. Um, as of today, Milestone Communications is marketing 115 Anne Arundel County public school sites for use as cell tower sites with up to three towers per site. Um, we also know that Milestone Communications is sponsor of the Maryland Association of Boards of Education MAVE annual conference in Ocean City. They have exclusive contact with our Board of Education members outside of normal procurement. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Who's that? Then I have the who's Jessica O'Kane. Good afternoon. My name is Jessica O'Kane, and I'm a homeowner in Anne Arundel County. I'm also one of the founders of the Anne Arundel County Against Cell Towers at Schools Coalition. That coalition was formed in May of 2013 in response to Milestone Corporation's proposal to put a 99-foot cell phone tower just over 100 feet from the first grade classrooms on the playground at Piney Orchard Elementary. Many in our community fought against this proposal for many reasons. One of the main reasons is that cell towers create a stigma and cause home values to drop. Across the, pardon me, across the entire United States, both real estate appraisers and real estate brokers have rendered professional opinions that support what common sense dictates. When large cell towers are installed unnecessarily close to residential homes, such homes suffer material losses in value which typically range anywhere from 5 to 20 percent. The stigma itself of a nearby cell tower decreases property value in the vicinity regardless of proof of harm. The United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, requires its appraisers to take cell towers into consideration when determining the value of a single family residential property, and HUD guidelines categorize cell towers with hazards and nuisances. The question needs to be asked is why the Board of Education is in the business of lowering our property values. And and leasing out property to private entities. 
I would rather see a Chick-fil-A at school, perhaps a spa when I drop off my kids, get my nails done. Why not a gas station? I have to travel so far to go to a gas station. I can get all my errands done right there. In addition, you're going to hear from Milestone and the Board of Education how cell phone towers on public school property by a private for-profit company is such a great fit. They'll make you all think that everything is running smoothly, that it's a good program, and the communities and schools support it. They will lead you to believe that their policies are transparent. However, all over Virginia and Maryland, there are coalitions coming together to oppose these installations. These communities are concerned with the depreciation of their property values, the safety hazards, lack of transparency, and failure to work within the communities that they would like to go in. Um, most, most often when communities find out about these meetings, it's already too late. I don't want to overwhelm you with the paperwork. I, do, I did a quick search online and came up with many, many, many articles of different groups that oppose um, installations on their uh, school property, and I have provided the link so I don't have to, you know, copy this 42 times for you all, so you can research that um, yourself. Um, so I'm, I respectfully ask that you support House Bill 727. Thank you very much. Hi, Thea Scarato. As a mother, it's my job to ask safety questions, and I was floored at how hazardous cell towers at schools are. Each vendor puts a 250-gallon diesel fuel tank in a bank of lead-acid batteries on the compound. The diesel generators are turned on for maintenance, the priming, and some models require once a week for 40 minutes. Diesel exhaust is a known carcinogen, not good when the tower is near an athletic field or near my nephew who has <coughs> asthma. In Maine, a tower generator leaked and there was 14 cubic yards of contaminated soil that needed to be removed. The current milestone agreement allows up to 15 generators a school, if every vendor had a, had a generator, um, which I think most do. I don't know. I've asked that question. And cell tower contractors have up to 10 times the death rate as regular construction workers. And the Department of Labor and OSHA are investigating the, and I'll quote, alarming rate of worker accidents and deaths in tower workers from objects falling from towers. What about our kids? who will be directly in the fall zone of these towers. They catch fire, as two did this fall in Ohio and Oregon. They were two school ones. And according to the Oregon News, the fire destroyed shrubbery near the athletic fields. But officials said it won't delay classes. It was a Saturday. We sent you the long list of fires, collapsed towers, and evacuations, and I spoke with a fire chief who told me they can't even extinguish a cell tower fire. They just have to let it burn. Now, the industry has a poor track record for safety enforcement. The Wall Street Journal did a piece, an investigation on radiation levels, and found one in ten were out of compliance. And the engineer was quoted as saying, it's like having a speed limit and no police. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers wrote the FCC in 2013 and said, ensuring compliance with existing RF radiation humic exposure limits is not effective and cannot, is not being enforced. When there is a hazard, the hazard creator has a duty to warn others against the hazard, they wrote. With a cell tower, third-party contractors have 24-7 access to the compound. They drive up in their white trucks. Um, and how do parents and staff know that that white truck is even a cell tower worker? And whose responsibility is it to check that this person has been properly checked in? Why would we want such an industry with so many safety concerns on my daughter's school? We may as well just put a gas station on it. Now, when I asked Milestone for safety information, diesel model numbers, maintenance schedules, I was not sent this information. No one is enforcing the, adequate, the inadequate safety regulations that are in place, much less putting in protective ones. A mother's common sense tells me this is a very bad idea. The land is for education, not for a dangerous commercial machinery. And when a child gets hurt, those parents are going to say, whose idea was this? Were they informed of these hazards? And, and why didn't they tell us about this? Thank you. That, well, my last that, sentence was, now we're all informed. And I think we should all take responsibility to keep schools safe. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And questions of this panel? Anyone? That's really, thank you all. Okay. Then I have um, uh, Margaret House. No. Okay. Uh, then and uh, is uh, Kim Trueheart? Not here. 
Okay. We're, I called Lynn Beaver before, and she's not here. Okay. Uh, but they covered it all, so she's here to help. Okay. I can. I. I'm, I get three minutes. I'll take it. I don't want to take up. Is, is that all right? It's fine. Okay. If you think they covered it all? Then. Well, there's a. I mean, I, I just have to question again why we are um, leasing taxpayer funded publicly owned school property to a private for profit corporation that has nothing to do with education. And um, I don't think that that question has been considered. And, you know, except the partial answer might be for the revenue. And that's so if it is for the revenue, why has there been no competitive bidding process? Um, and you know, school superintendents have no experience in negotiating cell tower lease contracts. Um, all over the country, um, municipalities, um, school boards and whatnot are getting taken advantage of for their lack of knowledge because this property that's being leased is not simply a piece of real estate and you look at the fair market value as you normally would for a piece of real estate. The potential value is tremendous and even the state of Maryland has put out a report of how we've missed out on the gold mine of these cell towers that we already have um, we are being offered chump change for these towers and my position is that if we're going to be stuck with these towers that I certainly don't want on school property and the term that comes to mind I really don't want to use but if, if we're going to do this to our children if we're going to use them if we're going to exploit them why aren't we going to get the most money possible why don't we hire consultants that know what these properties are really worth so that we could um, exponentially increase the revenue and I don't think that um, I have any other questions that's it this Thank you very much. Okay, the opponents, Len Forkus, Jerry Evans, Haley Evans. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Jerry Evans for Milestone Communication. With me is the president of Milestone, Len Forkus. Um, it's a lot to address in three minutes. Let me, let me try to at least get to the procurement aspects. Um, the initial request for uh, information was publicly issued on June 6, 2011, through the normal public procurement channels applicable to all Maryland public sector school system procurements. Eight viable service providers uh, responded, and the ultimate evaluation resulted in two finalists. Uh, two vendors ultimately were uh, Milestone Communications and Florida Towers. We were selected. As a result of the evaluation, the tower leasing program was publicly awarded to Milestone Communications on January 4, 2012 at a public Board of Education meeting. On June 20th, the telecommunications leasing master agreement was executed by the respective counter at a public Board of Education meeting. So all of these, uh, these, this rigorous procurement that we went through was all public and all approved by the Board. Um, just in general, and, and, and we're not going to talk about leases specific as to, as to Anne Arundel County, but generally speaking, Milestone shares 40% of the gross receipts it collects from wireless providers with the municipalities and schools housing the facility. Each lease starts at $30,000 gross receipts per year and increases at 3% annually. This equates to a minimum of 12,000 per year per wireless provider. And as Len will tell you, once these pet towers, because of the explosion of tablets and smartphones, once these, these towers are built, they're maxed out. That's what kind of explosion we have in the telecommunications industry today. Um, with that, I'm going to stop and let the President talk about uh, and try to address some of the, uh, frankly, misinformation that you got on an earlier panel. Thank you. Great. Uh, members of the Commission, my name is Leonard Forkus. I'm the President of Milestone Communications. Uh, we're based in Reston, Virginia. I'm happy to answer uh, questions that you may have, but I do want to address a couple of the 
uh, statements that were made by the folks that testified prior to, uh, to, prior to our, our testimony here. Uh, first is that uh, when it comes to issues such as uh, wireless siting, the biggest problem we have right now is that everyone wants their device to work everywhere, at home, at school, on the road, at work. And the only way that uh, wireless companies can achieve this objective is to build the infrastructure closer to where people live. And in many places, some of the best places to conceal the towers uh, are on public properties, parks, schools. We have over 40 different relationships with municipalities in Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, and South Carolina. And the one thing we have in common with virtually every single agreement is they all are under the very same economics that were competitively pr procured through the Anne Arundel County uh, public school process. Uh, there are questions regarding safety and the safety of workers. Um, we have a policy, and it's uh, in embedded in all the policies with the schools and the municipalities. It's always a 24-hour uh, prior notice before a worker ever comes to a site. They have to check in. The only time they're allowed to go to the site without checking in is if the power goes out and they need to go service the tower in the time of an emergency. The purpose behind the generators is to make sure that the wireless uh, towers are functioning during times of emergencies, like when Hurricane the Derecho came through or Sandy. And our first responders rely on those networks to be functioning. So that's the purpose behind the generators. And companies like Verizon, AT&T, and Sprint pay top dollar for the best generators money can buy to make sure that they're safe, they're secure, and they're, and they're properly maintained. Um, with respect to the tax issue, all I can say, I've been in business for 15 years building towers on public and private properties, and we pay our taxes. Uh, so that's really, I don't understand any uh, uh, question on that. Um, with respect to um, community outreach, uh, we believe that the most appropriate way to inform the community of our program is to make sure that all the information is readily available on the internet. So before we even schedule a town hall meeting with community members, we do photo simulations to show people what the tower will look like. We put information about when the meetings will be held. Uh, we notify uh, communities directly by mail. Uh, oftentimes, we're legally required to notify people around the property. We typically notify hundreds of people and ensure that the, the, the school community also has the ability to notify the school constituents. So that everyone, anyone that comes to one of our town hall meetings comes completely informed as to what we're doing, what it's going to look like, and what all the issues are so that we can uh, answer those questions from an informed public. And that's the process that we follow when we propose new towers. And again, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me here today, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Turner, members of the committee. My name is Beth Cooley. I am the Director of State Legislative Affairs at CTIA, the Wireless Association. CTIA is the trade association for the wireless communications industry. We represent the nation's wireless carriers, the handset manufacturers, and all of their suppliers. Um, I'm here before you today to respectfully oppose House Bill 727, which would place a moratorium on the construction of wireless telecommunications towers on Anne Arundel County public school properties, as we all know, from June 1st, 2015 through June 30th, 2016. We believe that this legislation could reduce the ability of wireless telecommunication carriers to deploy telecommunications facilities needed for public safety and to provide broadband services in one of Maryland's most densely populated counties. Furthermore, we are also concerned that this legislation may run afoul of federal law that particularly governs the time within which governments must act upon applications to construct and modify wireless facilities. Now, I know you all have my testimony before you. I will not read all of it. Um, we have some wonderful statistics in there. But I do just want to point out a few key concerns that we have with this legislation. First off, the policy that is proposed in House Bill 727 is counter to the direction of other states across the country, as well as recent federal actions. Many states across the country have actually been enacting legislation that would expedite and streamline the construction of wireless towers, not impede it. Furthermore, recent federal action also bears consideration by this committee. We have concerns, particularly that this bill may run afoul of a bill called the Middle Class Tax Relief and Job Creation Act of 2012 that Congress passed in 2012. Uh, specifically, Section 6409A of this Act 
provides that a state or local government, quote unquote, may not deny and shall approve any request for co-location, removal, replacement of transmission equipment on an existing wireless tower or base station, provided this action does not substantially change the physical dimensions of the tower or base station. The FCC in October 2014 implemented the actual rules of how 6409A should be implemented. The FCC determined that a state or local government has 60 days in which to respond to an application for any request for co-location, removal, or replacement of transmission equipment on an existing wireless tower or base station. We have concerns that the moratorium proposed in House Bill 727 may run afoul of federal law, particularly where a wireless tower may already exist on school property. It's important to note that this Section 6409A does become effective April 8th. So we're talking 20 some days, that will be the law of the land. Secondly, our larger concern with House Bill 727 has to deal with public safety. We're concerned that this legislation may create, absolutely, may create some coverage gaps with respect to accessing 911. So lots of great statistics in my testimony. I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, respectfully, we ask this committee to reject House Bill 727. I would take any questions at the appropriate time. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in terms of the reference that you made to running afoul of the federal law, have you sought out an AG or, you know, any guidance on whether or not it would, would impede that law? I, I'm sorry, can you repeat the, or the question? Did you seek out an, an opinion from the Attorney General on whether or not this would run afoul of the proposed law that you've We have not. Out? We have okay. just done internal consultation with our inter attorneys, and I am not an attorney. I want to be very clear. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Witness. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, that concludes the hearing on. Uh, wait a minute. I have. Yeah, that concludes the hearing on House Bill 727. Members of the committee, please turn to uh, House Bill 